A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. Created by Bloomberg Philanthropies, Bloomberg Connects lets you access museums, galleries and cultural spaces around the world on demand. Download the app to access digital guides and explore a variety of content. Hello, I'm Ben Luke and welcome to a new series of A Brush With, the podcast from the art newspaper in which I talk to artists about their influences from writers to musicians, filmmakers and of course other artists and the cultural experiences that have shaped their lives and work. And in this episode, it's a brush with Shutapa Biswas, whose work in painting, drawing, photography and video explores race and gender within the context of colonialism and its legacies, particularly in relation to her native India. Shutapa's art, made over five decades since the early 1980s, is both rigorously consistent in its themes and thrillingly diverse in mood and mode, by turns poetic, activist and even satirical. Shutapu was born in Shantaniketan in India in 1962 and came to the UK as a child. As you'll hear, the passage from India and arrival in the UK have been crucial to her practice and continue to influence the themes she explores today. She first studied in the hugely significant art and art history department of the University of Leeds, where she immediately challenged the Eurocentricity of the art historical curriculum, influencing its more inclusive change in approach. As an undergraduate, she produced two pieces that are now seen as crucial works from that period period of British art, the painting and collage Housewives with Steak Knives and a video and performance Carly, both of which were begun in 1983 and completed two years later. These two pieces set the tone for Shutapa's later work in their material diversity, the enmeshing of references to the art and cultural history of the global north and global south, and the intersectional approach to post-colonialism and feminism, as Shutapa describes in our conversation. Shutapa corresponded at that time with other emerging artists of colour who formed the Black arts movement, including a former guest on this podcast, Claudette Johnson, Shyla Berman and Libena Hamid, and was selected immediately following her graduation from Leeds for Hamid's landmark exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, The Thin Black Line, in 1985. Though she's continued to paint ever since, photography and video have been dominant in her practice since the late 1980s, after a hugely influential visit to India in 1987, where among much else she saw the extraordinary Ajanta and Alora temples, she used images from that profound experience in a series called Synapse, projecting them onto her naked body, much of which was enveloped in shadow. This was just one way in which she's consistently evoked India's presence in her work as a kind of haunting. The same is true of the installation Infestations of the Aorta, shrine to a distant relative, made between 1987 and 1989, which features a large negative transparency of Shutapa's aunt, who carries Shutapa's cousin, on her naming day. It's an intimate corrective to familiar Western images of the mother and child, but also evocative of the history of Indian portraiture and a deeply personal reflection on memory and identity. Shutapa has described the way she connects these different materials, references and contexts as a process of weaving and through this steady compositional approach she produces often startling images. In the film Birdsong from 2004 for instance, a child played by her son Enzo is confronted with a horse within a genteel 18th century interior. The combination of that time period and the equine image inevitably conjure the spectre of that great painter of horses, George Stubbs, and particularly his painting of a shooting party at Goodwood which features a liveried black figure in the corner of the composition. In contemporary terms, Shutapa poetically decolonizes Stubbs' painting. That term also applies to Time Flies, a marvellous ongoing installation of paintings of birds that appear in Indian art, which is a direct reference and subversion of the work of James Forbes, the 18th century watercolourist. Forbes was contracted to the East India Company, which controlled large parts of the Indian subcontinent and beyond, and pictured the flora and fauna of India as a kind of inventory of colonial possessions. As the curator Amy Tobin has written, while Forbes took stock, Biswas opened the cage. Perhaps Shutapa's most ambitious work to date is Lumen, completed in 2021, a 30-minute film which weaves together footage shot in England and India with archival film of the British Raj. The title is a metaphor. A lumen is both a unit of light and an anatomical term for the space in the tubes of the body along which air and blood flows. And the film poetically explores the ebb and flow of memory, the movement of people, and particularly the traumatic journey to London of Shutapa's mother, whose presence is evoked by the actress 
actress Natasha Patel. She delivers a monologue written by Shutapur that is emblematic of the poetry and political conviction that fuels her entire practice. In Lumen, she refines the fundamental elements of her earliest experiments. It's also an unflinching exploration of her own past, of the deep connections to her mother and father, and a reflection on her identity as it's formed from that complex history. And it's this with which I began our conversation. As you've heard, autobiography has been central to Shutapur's work from the start. Why has it been so important always to fuse the personal with the political? In part, my interest in using the autobiographical or bringing the autobiographical into my practice was really to counter the invisibility of voices from my particular kind of community and all the kind of historic references and backgrounds that go with that by referencing my mother by referencing my father, my son, my aunt, my cousins, my nieces and my nephews, alongside actually acquaintances that have become part of an extended family who also appear in some of my works. It's really about trying to build a discourse and a dialogue and an aesthetic and a kind of formal presence that opens up the spaces of what has been quite a Eurocentric, dominant, mainstream discourse around aesthetics and practice. And the ways in which people of the global south, people who've shared this history of colonialism, have really been either portrayed, as in Edward Said's sort of references, in a way that is very stereotypical. In other words, meek, mild, mad, crazy, violent, etc., etc. You know, one of the things that Saeed talks about is that it's not necessarily that the stereotype doesn't exist at all, but rather that within mainstream culture, we're not allowed as subjects who have experienced this history of having been colonised, we're not really given space within a cultural context, to really be seen and encountered and experienced outside of those very narrow kind of perceptions. And those narrow perceptions are a kind of violencing, I feel, of subjects such as myself, my family, my community of friends, my extended family, you know, who we are. So by bringing it to the fore, it enabled me a space to really use iconography and symbolism and metaphor to begin to disrupt those very limited definitions. You mentioned Eurocentricity there. It's really interesting that even as an 18-year-old when you were at Leeds, you were confronting really notable figures like Griselda Pollock who were seen as really radical figures and getting a lot of acclaim in the academic community at that time. And you challenged them to re-evaluate their position and and you pointed out to them their Eurocentricity. It's extraordinary that at 18 years old you had that conviction and you literally changed that course that Griselda Pollock was teaching. So tell us a bit more about that and, and about that confidence that you had to take that on board. You know, it's something that Griselda herself has definitely acknowledged. Yeah, to her credit, she's fully owns that, doesn't she? She does. She does. And, you know, it wasn't just Griselda. It was individuals like Fred Orton, John Tagg, TJ Clark. I challenged them all. And in a way that was very constructive, you know, Mm. I did make demands. But, you know, going back to your question, you know, I was born in India, in West Bengal, in a place called Shantiniketan, where my father had taught at the Tagore Institute that Rabindranath Tagore's forefathers had established and had, had played in as a kind of ideology, as an as a concept, had played such a significant role, you know, in the eighteen hundreds and onwards right through to Indian independence, in being the, the site of the birth of modernism. And my father was an academic there. You know, his subject was agronomy, so economics, agriculture, and that's very important in relation to the history of 
India and its colonial past, but also in relation to education. And my mother had been a teacher, so my father had been involved in the independence movement, although he was a pacifist. He came from a family of barristers. My grandfather on my mother's side had been engineers. So in many senses, I suppose we came from quite a, a, an upper middle class background. So there is a certain amount of entitlement, you know, comfortable or not. So I grew up with this confidence, really. But it was more than that. You know, my father really left India as a kind of political refugee because he disagreed with Congress at the time. And in the post-war moment of India, people forget how actually it was a very complex place. And post-partition, that certainly was amplified in terms of you know, there'd been a genocide, basically. Yeah. Never mind the 500 years of, you know, colonial rule and colonial extraction, basically, within the subcontinent. So, you know, he left India under very difficult circumstances. It wasn't really safe for him to return for, for several years. He, he left with pretty much overnight, you know, very, very quietly. And we followed six months later... My mother never wanted to come, but we arrived in London. My mother sort of agreed to come and live here only if she could live in a place where she had access to Indian food and spices. And my father really wanted to live where he'd sort of been living, which was in Hampstead and Swiss Cottage, <laughs> <laughs> where it was there was a very lively kind of intellectual discourse. But I understand what my mother was about, you know. And so we grew up in a really working class community on the far west of, of London in a suburb called Southall. It was kind of a very strange place in many senses. It was predominantly white when we first arrived. But because of the history of industry that, you know, around the airport, it attracted a lot of labour from the South Asian and Afro-Caribbean community. And there was already a, uh, quite a large Afro-Caribbean community in Southall. So slowly those things grew. But to go back to your question, you know, two things were very influential. The first is that I grew up in a household with this background, you know, where we talked about, you know, Wittgenstein and Marx and, you know, and Lukacs and education and you know, the history of colonialism. These aren't things that I learned at school. These were things that I was introduced to through my father. And I can't exactly say that as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old, seven-year-old, or a nine-year-old, <laughs> I particularly understood those things. Of course I didn't. But literature, you know, the books that we had in our home, the fact that we were always taken to the library, you know, these became very key sources. So I grew up in this household where we were aware of this history. And at the same time, the second thing that was really important to my upbringing was the fact that I grew up in this working class community where the National Front, for example, on a regular basis would be given grace by the then Home Office, the Tory government Home Office, to march up and down our streets with placards shouting abuse. And, of course, in 1976, there were the riots. Yeah. Blair Peach was murdered. These kinds of riots were, were regular things. You know, my friends of family were being arrested for, for peaceful protests. And then in 1981, right before I arrived at Leeds University, there were the Southall riots. And what happened during that was that the Southall Youth Movement resisted and protested against a fascist boy band, Skinheads, who were given permission to play in one of the main taverns on the main arterial street, about a mile and a half where, from where I lived. And the youth movement resisted, and they burned that pub down. This is the Hanbra Tavern. And, of course, that sparked race riots, actually, in Brixton, Toxteth. Right. So it became another part of British history. But it was actually terrifying, you know, seeing swastikas daubed all over, you know, walls in your local community was a very terrifying prospect. And 
when I arrived at the University of Leeds as a young undergraduate student on this really radical course, there were two things that struck me. The first was that, you know, one of the first images I encountered, and it was a cinematic scale, and I don't mean a small cinema, I mean Leicester Square big cinema, (laughs) Odeon, Leicester Square Odeon, huge sorts of screens, basically. And it was an image of Turner's painting, The Slave Ship. You know, it was one of two paintings. First of all, through Griselda's course, Mary Kelly's postpartum, I think was the very first image she put up. We spoke about um, Manet's Olympia. The course that I was on, Fine Art and Art History, was really about 70% art history. It was a fantastic course. So we were taught by scholars in each of the respective fields. But when I came into contact with Turner's Landscape, the tutor who was speaking about this, Tony Hughes, and was a lovely, lovely, kind, wonderful man, was referring to this painting with reference to the evocative nature of the brush marks, the atmospherics, etc., etc. And I was just thinking, but why aren't we talking about what's in the water? Yeah. And so I started to ask that question. Why aren't we talking about what's in the water? And I knew what was in the water because of what my father had shared with us. And so I think that at that point, that was when I had already started this dialogue with with Griselda, actually. It was just an incredible bond we had between us. And she was exceptional as a tutor. I was very lucky you know, because most of my tutors were were amazing in the sense that they were prepared to listen. They were prepared to listen because what I was saying and the voice with which I was speaking, what I was able to bring to that conversation because of my knowledge in terms of what I've learned from my parents Mm. was very well founded. And I realized very quickly that what was not being taught and what we were failing to see in the context of histories and art history, was any real conversation about colonial histories and that imperial past in relation to state sponsorship, for example, of the work by many of the Orientalist painters, Jean-Léon Jérôme. Mm -hmm. So I began to challenge those things, and that's where it came from. In 1982, I began to make Carly, Mm which is now in the Tate Collection and it's currently on show at Women in Revolt, Art and Activism in the UK, 1970 to 1990. So I'm very proud that that's in there. And also a very important painting, iconic work called Housewives with Steak Knives, also created when I was an undergraduate student. And so when I started to make Carly, I began to realise that what I needed to do was to bring in this iconography that fell outside of the knowledge base, if you like, of what we were being taught within an art historical framework. I wanted to talk about the way that you weave together, it's a term that you use yourself, histories and stories, and as we say, autobiographical information and so on. It's particularly clear in Lumen, which is a a recent film that you made, there is this weaving there is archival material, there is material that you've shot yourself, mm. etc., cetera, and, and across locations and so on. Tell us about weaving and why it's important to do that. I think, you know, one of the things that I noticed the weave of from very early in childhood was my mother's saris. And it was really from playing with that material, but also from hiding in the folds of the saris when she was wearing them. If, for example, if we had visitors and as a child, sometimes you're a little bit shy to come out of and say hello. So I remember just sort of tucking my head into the folds of the pleats at the front of my mother's saris. And then, of course, you notice the texture, how they're made. And, of course, different saris in India and f- from different regions of India have different histories in themselves. So, you know, a Banarasi 
sari from Varanasi, a silk sari from there, will have a very different texture to one that perhaps has been made in the Delta region of the Ganges or in Kerala or in Gujarat. You know, so I was very aware of colour and texture and the embroidery that was happening in those spaces. And one of the aspects of Lumen is that one of my mother's sari, it's this beautiful silk blue sari with a fabulous weave. It's very delicate. One of the saris that she brought with her from India and now is an antique has a particular kind of silk thread. And at about the age of five, I encountered my mother reading letters from home, you know, on blue aerograms. And on this particular day, she was wearing the sari and framed by the light coming in through her bedroom window. And she didn't know I was watching, but I saw her weeping. And when I came across Vermeer's painting, Woman Reading a Letter, I was immediately taken back to this moment where I'd witnessed my mother. And it just never, ever left me. So when I came back at the age of 18, I began to study fine art and art history and I re-encountered Vermeer's painting. And I began to research that work in relation to its Dutch histories. I began to read the iconography because I was being taught how to deconstruct imagery by my tutors who were art historians like Griselda, like Fred. You know, they were brilliant. So I was being taught on this post-structuralist, Marxist, feminist course, how to deconstruct and how to analyse imagery. And of course, I began to apply that to reading Vermeer's painting. And I began to realise that the map in the background is a metaphor, it is symbolic of the fact that the Dutch Empire at that period in history, in the 1600s and prior, was expanding. And of course, it took me back to the moment of the Dutch East India Company, which was really in existence from the 1500s right through to the early 1600s, around which time it was almost hijacked, if you like, by the British East India Company. But very aware of the fact that the blue that Vermeer was using in his paintings was ground from lapis lazuli, which was commonly used in other artists' work, but was in, in reference to Vermeer's work, was very important to me because that was the blue in my mother's sorry, but also the blue in Woman in Blue Reading the Letter. And I became very aware of colonial extraction and this history of, of trade. And so I began to make work that wove these histories together. And you see that really in Carly, you know, that's now in Tate Collection, but you also see it in Housewives with Steak Knives, wherein what I do effectively, you know, it started off as one piece of paper, one large sheet of paper, and then I put the you know, central character, it's this sort of Housewives with Steak Knives, it's kind of loosely based on the goddess Carly, which translates to black. It's a sort of self-portrait, you know, coming out of, this, out of this sort of white metaphorical space, which is representational of the institution. But it's also a reference to Rauschenberg's series of white paintings. Yeah. And you also see in that work a reference to Artemisius Gentileschi's painting of the 1700s of Judith beheading Holofernes, which I had collaged into that work by taking a photocopy of a page from a book that had been written by Rosika Parker and Griselda Pollock, who was my tutor, and put it into my painting, you know, in the flag, to draw this link and make a statement that was a feminist statement against violence against women, and to talk about the universality of that and taking a stand against that. But I was already beginning to weave art historical references and imagery into my work from a very early stage. And, you know, that work, Housewives with Steak Knives, sits forward of the wall 
comes into our space, doesn't it? It yeah, invades our space, yeah. Absolutely. And it comes into our space in a way that's a bit like a sail coming out at you or a banner, you know, or a protest banner, something like this. So the woven space, the woven materiality of my practice, which is also there in terms of the tunic that Housewives with State Knives, you know, the iconography, the image is is wearing. So it's sort of loosely based on an ICAT design, but it was taken from a Miss Selfridge top <laughs> that I owned at the time and I still have. It doesn't fit me anymore, but, you know, <laughs> I still have this top. So the materiality, you know, the material form and its references to trade was there right from the get-go. And these are things that are in my dissertation, but also emerged in that dialogue, in the dialogue that I was having with Griselda and people within the faculty, my peers, so on and so forth. Let's move on to the questions that we ask all our guests. Who was the first artist whose work you loved? I'm going to be a bit naughty and ask for two. (laughs) (laughs) And I guess the first is Vermeer's painting, Mm -hmm. you know, Woman in Blue reading a letter. That, I would have to say, is the first painting I really fell in love with. And I fell in love with it because of my mother. And that sense of always wanting to hold that moment in my life and trying to understand that moment in my life which then has subsequently been so inspiring to and important to the making of my recent film Lumen and how her history has been woven into that and the second I would say is it's a kind of moving scene from Satyajit Rai's Pater Panchali film Pater Panchali which I think if I'm not mistaken translates to well Potho is the the path and Benchali the the path of the small road or song and there is this beautiful moment which will forever stay with me and it's a film again that I encountered must have been at about age six when we came to this country my parents so missed India and England was a very different place then it was really racist it was grey, it was dull, it was just cold, bleak and they missed everything about home so they used to take every opportunity they could to go and visit the cinema and see classic Indian cinema I was about five so although I couldn't understand the dialogue, you know, the narrative of many of these films that I was watching, you know, there were two things that happened to me there. One, just seeing, you know, these beautiful dark-skinned bodies projected on that kind of cinematic large scale again was so influential to my practice and the kinds of things I've been drawn to in terms of my own subject matter. You know, you see it in Housewives, you see it in my own work with film you know there's large scale things but also some of the work which is very small scale you know thinking about scale and it is that moment for example that I remembered in Satyajit Ray's film where the two children you know Durga and her and her brother are kind of loosely playing and you know whiling away the time of day it was filmed in what was actually on the outskirts of Calcutta in what is known as the lowlands. And Jhumpa Lahiri talks about this in in her book of that name. And it doesn't really exist anymore because it's been so developed. But they are in this part of Calcutta, it's black and white film. Suddenly, one of the main characters, Durga, which is the name of a goddess, actually, a Hindu goddess, hears the train from the distance. And her brother is trying to distract her and she sort of puts her lips to his mouth and tries to silence him because she's saying, listen. And what we see at that moment is the sound of the train, which is very symbolic and metaphoric, crossing that landscape. They are running through the reeds of this extraordinary grassland to catch that train, to run with the speed of that train that's sort of belting out this kind of you know, steam and splat, coal smoke. And it's the most exquisite moment, I think, you know, pictorially, 
it just was magical. So I would say that, of course, those two things relate to each other in terms of Amir and in terms of this history and in terms of what the train represents by way of industrialization, but also in terms of what the railway had meant, which I more recently discovered, you know, when I heard from my mother that my grandfather, my mother's great-grandfather's forefather, had been an engineer who had worked for the British in Burma in constructing the railways there. So all of these incredible things really start to sort of weave themselves in and around each other. They're an entangled history, and, and they are entangled histories, I should say. That's wonderful. Which historical artist do you turn to the most today? Manet. I think he's a remarkable artist. And I think when I encountered his paintings, uh, again, as a young undergraduate student, I was just 19 in Paris. You know, I spent quite a long time, you know, just traipsing around all of the Parisian museums and galleries and having studied Manet's Olympia and all of the other kind of the Impressionist period, because, of course, I was studying urban and rural landscapes mm. in F France and England and as part of my art history coursework. So seeing that for the first time was really important to me. And I would say that, you know, as much as Rauschenberg and series of white paintings, you know, and his work was influential to me. I would say that Manet's work was equally influential. But that would be to exclude how important Artemisia Gentileschi's work also was to me, mm. or the work of Bertha Morisot, mm. or the work of Mary Kelly, who taught me, actually, at Leeds, you know, along with Laura Mulvey and, and many others. You know, so Mary Kelly's postpartum, I think has really been a presence in my life. And I think you can see that in all of the work because they are often about those kinds of familial mother, daughter, you know, daughter, father, mother, son, in my case, in my relationship with my son, you know, in, in my work, bird song and magnesium bird, mm. you know, those threads are very present, I think, and have this sort of ghosting and resonance that just continues you know, but the films of Fellini, Chantal Ackerman, you know, Agnes Varda, all of those things, just, I can't separate them. <laughs> <laughs> There's an entanglement of, entanglement of historic references, in other words. Yeah. yeah. But I would say that, you know, I do come back to Manet. In the film, Carly, there's this intriguing moment where you talk about Leonor Fini, where you say you're having a conversation with a tutor and you wanted to paint like Leonor Fini. But it was seen as a problematic thing to be able to do. But there is this really intriguing work of yours called Three Rose Tinted Windows, which seems to me to engage with that surrealist space, whilst also being very consistent with lots of your other works. So tell me about Leonor Fini and, and surrealism and whether that continues to have a resonance. It absolutely does, because, you know, Hinduism, I'm not a religious person at all. My father was an atheist. My mother, she is a Hindu, but she's not really orthodox in any way. And so I grew up in, you know, a left-wing household, basically. And, you know, if you have a look at the iconography in, you know, in these in Hindu mythology, they are so surreal. You know, an elephant god uh, that's both an elephant and human, whose wife, question mark, <laughs> is, is a banana tree. You know, the goddesses have eight hands or ten hands or four hands. They have multiple identities. You know, they can fly, they can swim, <laughs> you know, they can walk, they ride tigers, they can cross mountains. This is surreal. You know, so I grew up with surrealism and th the concept of what was surreal, you know, from day one, really. Mm -hmm. I think that Leonor Fini, I was drawn to her work because the work I was making before I arrived at Leeds was very surreal, actually. And I'd never come into contact with Leonor Fini. These were things I was making from the age of 12 or 13. You know, and these were very erotic, very sexual images of women mm -hmm. who were growing out of trees, who were flying, and 
what I felt was absent in that conversation with that particular tutor, you know, she was a visiting tutor, but a regular visiting tutor, Marie's, was that there was a lack of knowledge. She didn't really understand my history, or she didn't want to accept that actually the imagery, the iconography, the history that I grew up with was of significance in terms of how it could then filter through into my practice. That somehow, you know, Arthur Rackham's work, who I'd never heard of, and you know, maybe I'd seen in reproductions, was not really of significance to me. You know, was somehow, and she said this in a derogatory way, that, you know, it seemed that that kind of work that I was making at the time, you know, very powerful woman, you know, I couldn't get it right. Leonor Feeney was the exception. And I had to make text-based work or something. And I just really resisted that and thought, right, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make video and I'm going to make puppets and because I was very interested in fluxus. Mm. Fred Orton, you know, the happenings movement and because of my interest in the civil rights movement, I was really drawn to those things and I began to make Carly. You know, I thought, well, if you really won't see me, you won't see what's been important to my visual space, then I'm just going to make it be enough so that you'll run into it. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects, the arts and culture app. The free app offers access to more than 300 cultural organisations through a single download, with new guides being added regularly. Among the most recent additions to the app are the American Folk Art Museum, New York City's only museum dedicated to folk and self-taught artists, and the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, also in New York. Among the other guides on Bloomberg Connects are a host of UK museums, where Shooter for Biswells has exhibited or is represented in the collection, including Tate, the Leeds Art Gallery and the Graves Gallery in Sheffield. If you download the app, you'll find that the Guide to the Graves has in-depth audio features and texts on numerous works in its collection, from one of J.M.W. Turner's sunlit landscapes to a striped painting by Bridget Riley and a work by Marlene Smith, who, like Shooter for Biswells, was a leading figure in the 1980s black arts movement in the UK. To explore digital guides to all the partnering institutions, download the app today. It's available from the App Store and Google Play, and you can keep up to date by following Bloomberg Connects on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter, and Instagram. Which contemporary artist do you most admire? You've, you've mentioned a couple already. I love and come back so often to the work of Howardina Pendle. I first came across her work not as an undergraduate student because a real discourse around iconography, work that dealt with questions of, of race, gender and class, weren't there on the course, outside of Frida Kahlo's work, which we were taught a little bit about. Mm. And we, we were talking about Mary Kelly, Riddles of the Sphinx, feminist practices that came from the global north. But I was really drawn to Howardina Pendle's work through a journal called Heresies that was being published in the States by a group of radical feminists artists. Mm. And I was given a copy of Heresies by an artist called Mae Stevens, who was part of a group of New York based artists, you know, Joyce Kosloff, you know, they were friends with Lucy Lippard, you know, Joan Snyder, art historians like Moira Roth. You know, I was really lucky I got to meet these artists later. But in around 2002 or three, I met May Stevens, who came to do a one-off lecture. And then she did studio visits. And we talked about race and culture. And she gave me a copy of Heresies. And I came across reference to Howardina Pindle's work and to Faith Ringgold's work and to Betty Sayers' work through that issue. But you couldn't really find references to these artists in libraries. It wasn't till much later, around... 2010 that I first came into contact with Pendle's work and I just was so blown away with it when I then encountered it again at the Museum of Modern Art in New York mm. and what I was particularly drawn to in her practice in particular the work where she punches holes yeah. and then she writes numbers on these 
punched out holes that she then collages onto the surface of paper or canvas. And I did listen to an interview with her more latterly where she talked about how when she was looking for a job after she'd graduated, I think from Howard University and then Yale, that at that period in history, I think it was late 60s, early 70s, she couldn't get a job, you know. And on one occasion, she went to take a job in a secretarial position. And she wasn't considered because she was a black American woman. She's actually a black American Jewish woman. And, you know, there was no form for her to fill in. But I had already begun to think about the labor of what it meant to punch holes, that many holes in pieces of paper, Mm -hmm. to gather them, and then to go through that process of sticking them onto something and writing the numbers. For me, it became a conceptual work about not only incredible on a formal level, but this was about time and labor and class and race. And that absolutely sat squarely for me in relation to the themes that I was exploring within the context of my own practice, albeit differently. You know, time is so present within my work. Housewives with steak knives made between 1983 and 85 is made on pieces of paper that because of my interest in fluxes was always meant to disintegrate. Yeah. And the folds and the yeah ripples and so on. Yeah. And, you know, when it wasn't on exhibition originally, it was supposed to be rolled up and that was lending, engaging with the kinds of things that I've learned about fluxes and happenings and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it was about that performative space in itself as a painting, you know, as a work. And later it became slightly the the conservator's nightmare in the sense that they had to then try and conserve it and try to stop it from disintegrating. And... Ian Balcom, the writer, it was it's a very beautiful reading of that work. He talks about housewives with steak knives in a way that's, I think, really poignant. And he says that, apart from the things that we've already discussed in relation to the iconography, he says that whilst on the one hand it's the it's a conservator's nightmare, on the other hand, what it does is that it's a challenge to the conservator because Every time she's shown, she sheds part of her skin. And he makes the analogy and the metaphor of diasporic communities across the globe in relation who have been displaced through these imperialist and colonial pasts, who then have to gather their belongings and their things from the floor beneath them and reconfigure their lives to create something as spectacular and as beautiful and as new it's a combination of entangled histories and pasts so coming back to Pendle's work that's what I feel she's doing in that work you know when she'd been a secretary you know she's gathering something of the labor of a woman's space in the workplace but a black American Jewish woman's space gathering it from the bin and making something else of it. And through that impressing pencil onto each of those tiny spaces, these little holes that have been punched out, for me, that's what she was doing. So I just find it a sublime series of works. And that's what I come back to. Which museum or gallery do you visit most frequently? I probably visit Tate Modern most frequently and the National Gallery here in London. They are my two mainstays because it's the past and the present that comes together. It's those histories that overlap, crash and collide and give rise to to new thoughts and spaces. And I'm forever drawn to art historical works because this has really been impressed upon me since the age of 18. I mean, I'd studied actually the sciences before I came to study fine art and art history. I studied history and philosophy of science for the first year of being a student at the University of Leeds. So, you know, I'm drawn to how histories of art, both contemporary and historical, 
relate to an evolving space and reading in terms of its relationship to trade, to the sciences, to our practice, to patronage, all of those things. And every time I go there, you know, my brain just, my synapses start sort of <laughs> popping and it's an exquisite thing. I'm there for hours. Which cultural experience changed the way you see the world? Becoming a mother changed my experience. When my son was born, he, he re-engaged me with what it was to be a child again. And, you know, at 18 months of age, he put together his first sentence, which was, I'd like a horse to live with us. And it was staggering. <laughs> and you made it happen. <laughs> I did make it happen in the work called Birdsong in yeah. between 2000 and 2004. And I asked him, you know, where would it live? And he said, right here with us in our living room. And for me, that just opened up again a whole space about how through children's eyes, you know, they don't distinguish between what's possible and impossible. There is an extraordinary world that we inhabit as we are coming through life. And that perceptiveness is sort of washed out of us. It's sort of through culture, through schooling, all those things. It's kind of almost beaten out of us. And so I try to retain that moment and that experience you know deep listening I don't always get it right and he would be the first to tell you that um, <laughs> but I try and I think it's important because it takes me back to my own childhood and you know the things I first saw and and did as a child that are very really are very vibrant within my mind's eye still which writers or poets do you return to Marcel Proust I return to all the time and he too has a very personal connection in terms of there's the word time flies, which relates to your father and Proust and, and a particular passage in Swan's Way, is that right? Yes, absolutely. My father passed away in 2000 and he had been suffering with cancer. And in fact, the day of his passing or the time of his passing, I'd been editing a work called untitled Woman in Blue Weeping that was made in 1996 by me. Mm. And I was re-editing it for a forthcoming show. And I was doing it at the Architectural Association, actually. And I came out of that building, walked into Dylan's Bookshop on Gower Street in central London, just down the road from UCL and the Slade School of Art, where I'd been a postgraduate student. And I would love that bookshop. And I walked into one of the rooms and I just felt overwhelmed, really, because I was trying to think what would console me. I was very close to my father, would console me once he'd left us. And I had read Proust as a young undergraduate student. And so my hand just kind of reached out towards Proust's Swan's Way, Remembrance of Things Past. And... Opening up the pages, I read a passage in the introduction to the fact that the person introducing the book talks about how it's estimated that Proust had written more than five million words. And there was this beautiful reference to Proust's reference to time through the symbolism of the wood pigeon calling through the forest. And it just struck me at that moment that my father was very bird-like. And so I had to rush to the hospital. I called my husband and said, you know, I'm, I'm on my way back now. And he said, you need to come home really quickly because your father's very ill. We don't know how long he has to live. So we need to get to the hospital. So we arrived at the hospital. My father had unfortunately fallen into a, a coma. And my 
older sister wouldn't leave his space. And she just said, no, I just think he's going to pass. I'm not leaving. I refuse to go. And my mother stayed with her and I was there. And so the nurse who was there said, well, talk to your dad. We're not sure if he can hear. So I began to recount this story of Proust and what I'd just read to my father. And what I said to him is, dad, I'm kind of feeling broken that you're leaving us. And I want to share with you that I just bought these three books, actually. One was by Borges, strangely, a poetry book by Allen Ginsberg. I don't know why. <laughs> he was, and, and Proust's Remembrance of Things Past. And I, I recounted the story about the wood pigeon and time and distance. And I said, you, I'll never forget you, you know, although you haven't written five million words. You know, in my lifetime, I know that we've probably shared more than five million words. And I won't remember all of them, but I will remember many of them. And you will be my wood pigeon, you know, who I hear through the forest. You know, you will demarcate time and history and space for me. And he woke up at that moment, actually. It was quite extraordinary. He couldn't speak, but he began to weep and he began to bless us. And so it was a very moving experience. Shortly after he did pass away, you know, the, that night, actually. And the last words he said to me was, Kedona, which means cry ye not. Because in our culture, we say that you mustn't weep as somebody is leaving, as somebody is taking their last breath, because their spirit needs to leave the body. And having had this conversation with him about Proust's reference to the wood pigeon and birds. The first sound I heard when he did pass was the sound of birds outside the window. So it haunted me. You know, birds continued to haunt me from 2000 right through to today. And for days, all I was drawing after his death was birds, you know, birds that were from my own imagination pictures of birds that I found in magazines or books. And that sense of demarcating time, you know, my father was a bit like a bird because he hated the English winters. And whenever he could, after he was able to return to India after some 14 years, he would fly south. <laughs> and so for me, that relationship between birds and the kind of metaphorical thing is also related to journeying of birds, the migration, but also because whilst I was making Lumen years later, I discovered James Forbes's watercolour drawings of birds. You know, he worked for quite a long period of time. He worked for the East India Company and he was making paintings, watercolour paintings. He was an amateur artist of the flora and fauna. And these were often the flora and fauna and artefacts that were part of the economy of what was traded by the East India Company. So this kind of haunting of the bird is something that keeps coming back to me. What music or other audio do you listen to while you're working? I tend to listen to Radio 4 and sometimes sort of have conversations and shout at it. <laughs> <laughs> A very British pastime. Yeah, Radio 4, Radio 3. So I oscillate in, in that way. But the music that is most precious to me is I love listening to Indian ragas. Mm. And, you know, the morning raga, I have some old raga recordings on tape. And so they often are important to me in terms of listening and throughout the day. And one of my favorite musicians is John McLaughlin and Shakti, partly because there's a confluence between influences from the West and the East, as it were. Some of the tracks, India, Isis, which is a reference to the, the goddesses, A Handful of Beauty, you know, these are things that just travel through my body, actually. They almost send me into this strange state of hypnosis. And in the way that Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan 
does. Those sounds, those ragas, you know, massive attack. They've worked with Nusrat Fati Ali Khan, you know, but there is this beat in their work that is incredible. And I love the work of, of Khan, you know, oh, right, yeah. and a lot of kind of instrumental stuff. But, you know, Joni Mitchell is somebody who I come back to all the time. John Coltrane, Betty Davis. I have a really large music collection. There's a massive <laughs> pile of CDs behind us, enormous uh, CD collections behind us as we sit here. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Lots of what you're saying there, I'm intrigued by because of the rhythms in your work mm. across multiple media, but also in lots of the people you've just mentioned, of, you talk about almost a kind of meditative experience of listening to it, like Massive Attack and Can, even in extremely different ways, but have a kind of metronomic feel that can actually create a kind of state of hypnosis that you talk about yeah absolutely also listening to monastic chants recordings mm. of of this and, and classical music but yes you know there are some things written by George Harrison that stay with me and sit with me and it is those melodies that occupy these multiple spaces you know there is an amazing album by David Sylvian I think it's called bees on a cake and there is one track on that where I forget the name of the singer, which is shameful, but, uh, you know, forgive me. But if you listen to her singing this raga, it seems to undo me in a way that's extraordinary. And it sends me into a deep state of hypnosis, actually. When I was making Lumen, that was the very last thing I would listen to on repeat before I fell asleep. And that was right across almost three years of making Lumen. At this point, I asked what other media influenced you. You've already mentioned some film, but I wanted to talk about one filmmaker who I know has been important to you, and that's Jean Cocteau. Mm -hmm. In Lumen, there are scenes involving mirrors and you can't avoid the Cocteau connection. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that happened with Lumen is that it was actually filmed during the pandemic. And originally, we were hoping to work with more than one actress. And that wasn't possible in the pandemic. So I had to really figure out how to create another actor, a presence, without having access to more than one actress. And so it became a device, a very simple device, in that I started to write the narrative, the script, such that my actor was able to speak into the mirror and create this alterity, you know, this alternate space and world. And it took me also back to the way in which within film, the use of mirrors is a very common device. We see it in Jean Cocteau's Orphée, where one of the characters literally is walking through the mirror. Yeah. And also in, for example, Beauty and the Beast, in the film All About Eve, some of Hitchcock's film noir, the mirror it has a presence in Rokeby's Venus, in art historical works. And so it became really important to me. It became a portal, as well as this extraordinary textual space that would make reference to Freud's you know, sense of the Eid mm -hmm. and relate to concepts around psychoanalytic theory. I'm not a psychoanalyst, obviously, but I am interested in those kinds of concepts. And part of my film Lumen was shot in the Red Lodge in Bristol, which was established, the foundation stones were laid at the beginning of the 1600s. And it's important to know that the Red Lodge is actually built on top of a kind of a water table, you know, so there is a place where within the building, there's a well underneath. And that is covered today by a very thick sheet of glass. And you can see the water below it, but it's lit up. So it has this kind of almost moon-like presence, which in part is where the term lumen right. comes from. And we were originally intending to film it, maybe, but it didn't really work. So rather than the camera pointing down at this lit up, moon-like, round space, I changed it by putting a mirror on the floor and having my actress speak down and look down to it. So these things were very present when I was making my work. How wonderful. If you could live with just one work of art, what would it be? <laughs> That's so mean. 
<laughs> probably, if I could possibly afford it, a work by Howard Dean Pendle or Artemisia Gentileschi's self-portrait. If <laughs> HRH would only let me have it. <laughs> That's a great answer. And lastly, what's art for? It's for pleasure. It's for beauty. It's for thought. It's for life. It's for love. It's for making your world bigger and moving out into the world, but also allowing you introspection to think deeply about one's connection with the wider world. That's what art's about. It's about beauty and it's about poetry and it's about narratives and it's about life. Shitava, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Shutupa Biswas is in Women in Revolt, Art and Activism in the UK, 1970 to 1990, at Tate Britain in London until the 7th of April 2024. She's also in the Time of Our Lives at the Drawing Room in London from the 25th of January to the 21st of April 2024. She's then back at Tate Britain for Photographing 80s Britain, a critical decade from 21st of November 2024 to the 5th of May 2025. And she has a solo exhibition at Bristol Museums in the UK also next year. And that's it for this episode. Please subscribe to A Brush With wherever you're listening and do give us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Do also subscribe to our sister podcast, The Week in Art, a deep dive into the latest big art world stories, the top shows and the key issues every week. And please subscribe to The Art Newspaper at theartnewspaper.com. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram and Threads. Production, editing and sound design on A Brush With are by David Clack and the producer on this episode is Alexander Morrison. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway, a big thank you to Shooter for Biswas. Bye for now. A Brush With is sponsored by Bloomberg Connects. Download Bloomberg Connects today and discover cultural institutions on demand.